Ephesians chapter 4, turn there on your phone. I still like the book. I just like feeling the book. You know, my sermons are now on my iPad. And I used to be so insecure about doing this. Because I thought, if they see me looking at my sermon on my iPad, then they're going to think I'm not spiritual anymore. And then all of a sudden, y'all all caught up with me with your phones and your iPads. I thought, okay, no, I'm not so bad now. Y'all just like me. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Ephesians chapter 4, 11. Sometimes when you want to learn, you know, before I start, real quick, because some of you had not had an opportunity, uh, you want to testify tonight. You want to testify about the goodness of God in the land of the living. I love that little phrase. I say it often. I don't even know if it's in the Bible. But I like saying it. The goodness of God in the land of the living. So what about, yes, sir? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, the difference in body, soul, and spirit is so... You know, when I'm teaching it, I'm thinking, okay, I am not the expert on this. I'm really not. You know, I mean, I, I, I see what the Scripture says. I'm trying to teach you and trying to help you understand it. I do know all three are different. But, uh, and I think have the body part was the fun part for everyone. But then you have to get in the spirit and the soul. Uh, there is a guy from many years ago by the name of Watchman Nee who did a book on spiritual authority. And uh, I used to have the book. I lost it in the flood. Uh, the first flood, and, uh, but it's a great book. Watchman Nee was persecuted, uh, ran out of, uh, I don't know if it's China or Taiwan, uh, for preaching the gospel. And uh, I'm not sure even about his, at the end of his life if he wasn't martyred. I know Witness Lee was martyred. There were two men, Watchman Nee and Witness Lee. I know that sounds kind of weird, but I was connected with some Taiwanese for years when I started the church here in Crosby, and, uh, and they taught me that. And so Witness Lee had won Watchman Nee to the Lord, and then, of course, he, the book is Spiritual Authority. It's really a simple book. I had it in college. And uh, oh, hold on, my pastor's calling me. Uh, y'all got a minute here? Yeah. Hey, Pastor Mike. Hey, young man. I forgot you probably have a Bible study or service tonight. Well, I do. And a matter of fact, you're, you're live right now. They're listening to you right now. <laughs> well, and God is great and greatly to be praised. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> How you feeling? I am doing well at physical therapy twice, three times now, and uh, it's uh, could really couldn't be any better. The handling the pain, and I'm able to do all the exercises. So I'll go home tomorrow afternoon. All right. Well, this church here is praying for you, man. Well, then I knew I would get better and have a smooth sailing. Smooth sailing, and then you're going to be racing walkers with other people. I will. I've already, uh, I've gotten invited to several uh, uh, races. <laughs> you need to let us build you a special walker. You know, we can do it down cool. here right before Muscle Car Sunday. We can put some mag wheels on it, some chrome. I'd love it. I would love it. <laughs> that would be gorgeous. Oh, Pastor Mike, we love you. Thanks for, uh, well, I, I thought you might call, so that's why I had you ready here, so. Okay. We love you. So love much. you and love you, church. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye bye. That's cool. That's funny. That don't happen very often. But I don't often have my phone up here because sometimes folk will call me. I don't want y'all to talk to them. You know, I just. <laughs> my pastor is a pastor's pastor, and he taught me how to uh, do a lot of things that I do. And if you want to be a success in something, you need to. Maybe not mimic or emulate, but, but look into examples. I often find that emulation often leads to envy, and envy leads to elimination. Did y'all follow that? To emulate, uh, Cain was upset with Abel's offering, and he tried to emulate an offering, and, and because of that, he got envious, and envious led to elimination. You just have to be very careful with, with, with that. But uh, to emulate, is, it sounds good in the beginning, but you don't want to stalk them. Uh, you know, that's what a lot of people do when they try to take over somebody's persona or who they are. But I, I, the scripture was given to us as an example. And tonight I want to talk to you just very uh, briefly, but about an example. And the guy that I call Paul the pastor. If there was one guy in scripture that showed us how to be a pastor, it was Paul. And one of the things is I'm trying to help you learn your role in the body of Christ. And the only way to really do that is help you understand my role and Paul's role. And as I, I walk through this, I see this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. It says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, 
the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to, to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. I think any pastor, leader, ministry leader, I don't care if it's in youth, a children's ministry, nursery, uh, outside doing service work, ministries, whatever it is that you're doing, reaching the, the ladies' groups here, the men's groups, whatever it is, whether it be the four, you know, four by fours, all the things you're doing. As leaders, you've got to understand your, your place is to help people understand their place. And Paul mentions five things here. He mentions the apostle. He mentions the prophet. He mentions the evangelist. He mentions the pastor. He mentions the teacher. And you've heard me say this for a year, that the apostle is the one that opens and closes. You can't open a mayonnaise jar without this. You've got to have the thumb. Amen. So that's the thumb. Then it's the five-fold ministry. It's the hand of God going out into the world working. Then you've got the, the prophet, which is the finger of God speaking and directly into your heart, can often speak of things in the future. A lot of prophets can. The evangelist, the longest reaching finger. The evangelist is the missionary who's going out into all four corners of the world. The world, I don't know, does it have four corners? Does that make a square? Uh, I don't know. But either way, that's what the evangelist does. He travels out. Then you've got the one that's married to you. That would be me. Amen. The pastor, the ones that, that love you as a group of people. Amen. And then the teacher helps clean out your ears so you can hear the word of God. Okay? So there's your five-fold ministry. Now, Paul was an apostle. He started churches. He built them up. He got them going. But because he's an apostle, he can touch all the other ministries. Very seldom can a pastor be an apostle, an evangelist be a, that. Or, but the apostle can be all of them. He can teach. He can pastor. He can evangelize. And he can... Uh, prophesy, give you a word. Now, I've fallen in all four of those, so some people look at me as an apostolic type ministry. I've been told I could start a church in the woods and people would find me. Yeah, but that's, that's the thing, because in, in simply an apostle pulls people in, sends people out, builds them up, and sometimes has to pull them down. And that, that is a lot of the ministry. So when I'm reading about what Paul did and how he did it as an apostle connecting First Thessalonians, and we're going to stick with these, just these couple of verses here, two verses, and walk through it. The church of Thessalonica, he had a church at Philippi, which he loved. He loved that church. He spoke about Philippi in the book of Philippians all the time. The Corinthian church, the church in Corinth. But the church in Thessalonica, he said to them, After all, what gives us hope and joy? And what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? It is you. Yes, you are my pride and joy. And when I'm reading this, I'm thinking to myself, now that's a pastor's heart right there. That's his reward, to be able to look at people and say, you are my reward. And then the, he mentions the fact that when Christ, that you'll see him, amen, when Jesus returns. In other words, that there'll be a, we're going to see one another again. So first of all, let me just give you just a few several thoughts. Use your ministry to build your people. I, I posted something this week. Some people will take people and build their ministry, but I believe it's the will of God to take ministry and build people. And I've seen too many churches that, that the pastor was trying to take people and build his ministry and look out, hey, look how big I am or look what I'm doing. But the, the opposite is true. God's given all of us gifts in order to build people up. And then live as close as possible to your people. Live as close to, I, I remember years ago when, when churches were blowing and going, it was kind of like the thing to do was, you know, you preach and then you slip out the back door or you hide away from the people. And there was this mystique about, so, so what you forgot was the pastor was a dirt bag, right? And all he showed you was his gift and then he'd run, he'd show you the gift and run, show you the gift and run. But when you live close to people, when you connect with people in, in everyday life, then it shows them so much more who you really are. And then you get to know who they really are. Many years ago, I learned this one principle, and I believe it to be absolutely true, that no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Once they find out you care for them, that you understand them. And, and I was with a guy after a funeral, and this really kind of hit me. Uh, Saturday, I did a funeral, and this big guy, man, he's a big old burly guy with a motorcycle jacket on. He's the head of a club, and, and he's also a police officer, yada, yada. So anyway, we're back in the back, and he's telling me, well, you know what turned me off from preachers and churches, pastor? And then, of course, here I'm in the back going, what was that? And this is right after he told me how wonderful he thought I was. You know why? Because all he saw was my gift, right? He don't know me yet, but he's fixing to know me because I'm fixing to say something to him. 
I don't care how big you think you are. When you say something, I, I, I'm a defender of ministry. And he said, I had a friend who was a pastor, and he was a great guy. I loved him, you know, all, all this. But I was going through a divorce, and I needed him down there at the courthouse with me to stand with me. Instead, somebody died, and he had to go take care of the funeral. I figured they were already dead. You can't help them out. Come help me. So I quit church. So I'm looking at this knucklehead who rides a knucklehead. And I said to him, Sammy, sir, you put your pastor between a rock and a hard place. There's no way that he could have went and stood with you at that court because his place is not to the dead but to the living. I said, this message today that I preached to you was not to Mark who had died but to you guys that are living. Amen. I can't do nothing for the dead when they're gone. I try, but most of them stay dead. They do. I'm, I'm batting zero right now. I'm telling you. But as a baseball player, I can still keep my job. So, so I, I, I looked at him, and, I, and he said, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. He said, I'd like to come to this church. I said, oh, I think you should. I think this would be a great church for you. But many times people don't have an understanding of, and especially if you've got, we have about 700 active members on Sundays. And when you look at the peripheral of 40 years of ministry in this area, or 30 years of ministry, then you've got over 1,000 plus people that look toward you when something happens. I walk into a hospital room like I did yesterday with Robert's family. I know all of them, but I've only seen two of them at church. But every one of them know me. I'm walking up, and they're saying, hey, pastor. And I don't know who's, hey, who's telling me that, but they've seen me somewhere. And so there's that connection, which is important because, again, you've got to live close among people. Isolation is fatal. It's fatal in ministry. It's fatal in life. It's fatal in uh, isolation. is fatal for teenagers. It's fatal for anybody in life. Isolation is fatal. Solitude becomes a momentary reward. Solitude is me seeking God for a purpose in my life. But isolation can get you in trouble. And a lot of people, they fall into isolation. It's fatal in their lives. So let me just talk to you about a few things. Knowing people as the preachers and the leaders, and I would say all this, and I've preached this to you guys for years. Every member is a minister. There's no big eyes and little U's in here. What's important to me is that some of you visited the hospital this week, amen, while Br Brother Shuhart was there and ministered to Debbie. That's ministry, amen. Uh, you know, yes, I went. Yes, I went yesterday. Uh, uh, I, you know, I even tried to put it off a few hours till I found out that how critical it was. And then I turned my truck around and headed to Baytown. You know, there are times that life is critical. You have to make those, those decisions to make it. But... It's my place to help teach you to go to the hospital, amen, to go and pray for people that are sick, uh, to, to help out folk that are, in that are struggling in life. It, it, I don't care if it's building a wheelchair ramp or, or, or getting a, an old preacher a, a set of wheels to walk around on, you know, whatever it is. But that's what we're called to do. It is the man in the street whom the preacher must know. And if he does not know him, no other sort of knowledge will make him a successful preacher. A lot of times pastors will try to let people come to them before they get to know them. I like going out. I like being connected with people. I like doing things to kind of shake some things up in life. And I found that as a church body, the more we go out, the more God's going to bring in. The more we reach outside these walls. If, if a pastor really desires to serve the people, he will not count time loss, which is spent in their company. The closer he comes to them, and I'm just going to give you an idea about myself. The closer he comes to them, the larger is opportunity to give them what they need. What they're fearing and hoping, feeling and thinking, enjoying and suffering, loving and hurting and hating, reading and dreaming. All this can become known to him only as he comes into contact with them. And to know these things is more important than to know nine-tenths of all the books you can teach. You know, it wasn't Bible college that taught me how to be a pastor. It was you. You taught me how to be a pastor. You taught me what needs were. You taught me what hurts were. You taught me what love was. You know, I learned that by being, I, I was with uh, some missionaries last week, as you know, in Montana. And some of them graduated from the same college I did. And one of them was a young, he was actually my young nephew, who's 30 years old now. And I said, have you, he, he made it three years of college. I went four. And I said, have you figured it out yet? And he said, what? And I said, it takes us three or four years to get through college, but it takes us about 20 years to get over it. And I'm finding out that, uh, that the, uh, the issues that I'm, I'm seeing in life is the same way with almost any college. You know, you go to college, you learn a bunch of nonsense. You didn't pick up anything. You didn't get a trade. You didn't figure out how to do it. But when you're around people, when you connect with people, and this was what Paul's passion was. He was a marketplace man like Jesus. He was always in the markets. He was always moving to and fro. His missionary journeys took him to places, often jail. 
but he would meet people in jail too. Amen. It was great. I had a great time when I was in jail. You know that. Uh, I've met a lot of great people in jail. Unfortunately, some of them, I've done their funerals. In short, it is the gospel of love which the preacher is most in need of. Not until he loves is he truly born of God. And, you, and you've heard me say nobody cares how much you know again until you know how much you care. Now, this heart, and I use the shepherd's heart, and I know I've taught you to be lions and, and to take care, care of dominion, but the Bible does add this thing about a shepherd, that we are to be shepherd or we are to take care of people. And the nature of the case, pastors and ministers and preachers and you yourself do many things because there are many things that have to be done. And this is what I want to tell you. If anybody wants to be a pastor these days, especially in this day, you must have understanding of administration, finance, social media, cultural trends, local news, national news, politics, social issues, theological trends, and he needs to know something about history, literature, science, and sports. That's a lot to put on a guy that only wanted to study the Bible. But I mean, I, I'll swing my chair over and yell at Joseph. Hey, Joseph. And he'll, you know, all the stuff you see, a lot of the stuff you see popped up on this overhead either came from Joseph or it came from Lori, it came from Cheryl. I'm dumb as rocks about it. I, I, I write something out and I throw it on the desk of, of Josiah and I say, proofread that for me. You know, because I, in learning how to type, learning how to do. And then the financial side. Oh, my goodness. What is all this about? And you have to, if you got to know that, and if you don't know administration, if you can't be a, a, a boss, an employer. And one of the things I've learned as an employer is I, I very seldom, it'll be an accident if I ever say that he, I, he works for me. He don't work for me. He works with me. That every employee, every volunteer, and everybody in our church works with me. Nobody works for me. And that's one of the best keys that I could have in ministry and to teach somebody else. That I'm no big eye and little you. Amen. I just somebody... If you're watching online, something's happening outside. Okay, just giving you a head up there. So, above all else, the pastor has to know the Word of God. And he must know the Word, love the Word, immerse himself in it. So that when he stands on Sunday, he's got a message that touches the heart of the people. And one of the things I'm, I'm striving to more and more, I have preached, guys. I, have, I know I've preached on Sunday mornings. You could call it a, a Campbell's can sermon. You know, uh, things went th that week, and I wasn't able to get here to, to study as much as I could. But I have endeavored for over 30 years to preach something that was good for somebody on Sunday. Every time I come in here, I try not to just, even as I move toward this, what, is this, what does February mean to me? What does January mean? As I move toward March and April and the Easter and the cross, all them things start coming back out to me. And then I say, now hold on. I've preached on the cross and Easter for, for 30 years. God, give me a new insight. and you Give me something to see where, where they don't sit back and go, well, I've heard that one before. You never say that when you hear your favorite song. <laughs> but when it's your sermon, you know, I've heard. So I, I'm always asking for insight. Give me some insight. This guy, same way with body, soul, and spirit. I've preached on the soul before. I can tell you I've preached on it twice before over the last 27 years. But I've never added the body in it. You know, so it's trying to do something to help you grasp and to grab hold of something just a little bit different. Now, let me show you something here in Acts chapter 6. And I, I don't think you've got this, bro. Okay, this, so you're going to have to look this up on your phone. Acts chapter 6. Verse 1, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing. Now, you remember there's a great explosion. Thousands are getting saved. Churches are breaking out. The Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were, not, were being overlooked. Now, the Hellenistic Jews were of a different culture and language to the Hebraic Jews or the Hebrew Jews. So there was this little contention going on because as the body of Christ, we want to have integrity or integer or to integrate the whole group together. So they're trying to work them all out together. So they are fussing about and upset over the daily distribution of, of food. You remember that time? They're also doing a lot of communal type things. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the, of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn their responsibility over to them and will give our attention in prayer and the ministry of the word so that we can give ourselves over to the ministry of the word. Now, listen to me real quick. I've seen this twisted in so many different ways. Just this little passage, Ronnie. This is where what is known as deacons come from. Now, if you were ever in a church where there were deacons, dusty deacon meant we run the church and the pastor. That's what modern day deacons mean. 
Amen. We, we take care of it. We run it. We look after it. We tell the pastor what he can and can't do. We tell him how much he's going to make. Amen. And then when we're tired of him, we're going to get a younger one and run him off. And this is how we're going to do it. That's modern day deacons. Now, the early church deacons were to take care of the widows, was to take care of people that, you know, for say, even right now, if, if I knew of widows that were in need of food, that I would be able to tell somebody in this church, guys, we got to, somebody's got to step up here. And, and spirit and, and wisdom, it simply means that you, you, you love God and you're smart. You're wise about what you're dealing with here. But this is the modern day. Now, on the flip side, the disciples said, man, we, we got to stay in prayer in the Word. And I've met pastors that said, hey, we got to stay in prayer in the Word, so we're going to have everybody else do everything else, and we're not going to do anything. So this is the opposite end of that. Somewhere in the middle has to be a balance because Jesus taught us all to be servants. He taught us all to serve one another and to love one another. And the greatest among you is the servant of all. So when I read what Jesus said, I read what the disciples are saying here, then I realize, you know, I, I got to grab the balance here. First off, we do need men, men and women that are full of the Holy Spirit, amen, that's going to be full of wisdom, that can go out and be, be wise and help one another. Now, this was a different day. But what happened was this thing twisted over the last 2,000 years, and all of a sudden the tail started wagging the head. So in the church world, if you're with me and you've worked in other churches, you come in here and go, well, where are the deacons at? Well, uh, we call them servant leaders in the house. And we let them decide if they're going to be one or not, if they're going to step up and, and show up and pray up and give up. You know, I used to do meetings all the time and all that. But pretty much you, all you got to do is be wise enough to show up, pray up, and give up. You mowing grass, you're a deacon. You weed eating, you're a deacon. Hey, Amen. You cooking back in the back, sister, you're a deaconess. You hear what I'm saying? By the way, thanks for the pancakes. Yeah. Amen. Everybody seemed to really appreciate that. So that was good. Now, listen, this is what's important because this is like it's, the, it's body ministering to one another and helping one another. So here, the, you know, I have sought and I've found this shepherd's heart. Either you use people again to build ministry or you're going to use your ministry to build the people. Thessalonians, let's go back to those two verses. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it... it is it not you? Indeed, you are, glory, you are glory and joy. In these words, there's a glimpse into this pastor's heart. First, he's talking about there's a heavenly coronation. How, how did he feel about the, these believers of Thessalonica? First, they were his hope. As I move through life, I realize this church is my hope. You know, I've connected. I've, I've chained myself to it. It's my hope. Because he kept thinking about what God was going to do through them. Second, they were his joy. Both now and in heaven. He talked about even when I get to heaven, I see you, I'm going to be joyful about that. They were his crown. The word refers to a wreath of, uh, of leaves given to the winner of an athletic contest. He, he means that his reward in heaven would be the pleasure of seeing all these new believers standing with him. Now, if you don't think somebody, you, you've put seed in their life, you've watered that seed, and they gave their life to Jesus. And H, you mentioned this, that you were in prayer of, for quite a while. You had somebody, what you called the hit list, which is a prayer list, and they finally gave their lives to Jesus. Then what a joy you're going to have when you see them again. Amen. When we prayed for him, we believed God for him, we connect to him. Think about it. Is anyone going to be in heaven who will come up to you and thank you for having a part in their life? By teaching them and helping them with the word of God? Have you given your support to missions? You know, one of the things that stirred in my heart was, God, we need to take care of more missionaries. We need to work more toward being missionaries, to going out to evangelize and connect. You know, and if you have someone you have never known, someone from the other side of the earth may come up to you in heaven and thank you for your support. They will thank you for being interested in getting the word of God out to them. I, you know, I, I was at this meeting in Montana, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it was a brother-in-law of mine, John Cathcart, Pastor John. And he, in the meeting, stopped me, he said, and he pointed over at me, and he said, when Pastor Jerry had 25 people in his church, we were trying to send Bibles to Russia. And he said, it was way over my head to do it. And we, 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 it was too much money to do it. And, he, and there were 25 people, he said, Pastor John, we'll take a, 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 thousand, a, a thousand Bibles, thousand dollars or whatever. I think it was a dollar Bible, a thousand Bibles we want to send to Russia. He said, with 25 folk, he said, I never forgot that. I forgot that. That means I might get to heaven and meet somebody from Russia because we had a little part in it back in the day. 
You know, you, you don't know the influence that you've got and what you've done. They, they will thank you for being interested in getting the word out to them. You reach them. You enable them to be saved. And that, my friend, is going to be a part of the reward we're going to get when we get to heaven. Then he talked about this earthly celebration. You are our pride and joy. Not just in heaven, but right now you are the most important thing in the world to us. When you feel that way as a leader, a pastor, a minister, somebody that cares for other people, as a mom, a dad, you got to think about, you got to think about that. You watch these new parents? That word precious comes to mind. He says here, you are a pride and joy. Oh, my goodness. What happens when a baby's born? It's stupid. You can't wait to tell the good news. You have pictures. You have stats. You have stories. You got pictures before they came out of the birth canal to show everybody and how smart they are and how it doesn't matter what the doctor says. You know, he, he smiled at you. You know that baby was smiling at you. That was not gas. Amen. You're all excited about that picture. They're the smartest, best-looking, cutest baby ever born. And you, you're going to tell everybody. That's exactly how Paul felt when he talked about the church. And you know as good as I do, one day that child going to be a, a teenager and you ain't gonna think nothing like that about that kid but while they're young dumb and I mean when they little like that you don't think nothing about it you think they're the most precious thing in the world don't we amen and I, I hate to look at parents and say that baby's ugly you know and I've, I've held my tongue a lot of times I just smiled you know yeah it's cute yeah it's good bless your heart you know beauty's in the eye of the beholder and you're blind as a bat but here's your baby back anyway but it's how, it's how Paul felt toward the church. And I know some people could look at our churches, you know, and they're not the, the prettiest buildings. Maybe we're not the fanciest looking people in the world, but I love this church. I love the people in this house. It's, there's something very precious to me about you. And you got to love them. Love the people to whom God has called you. There are people I'm not called to. I just know that I, they can call me, but I'm really not called to them. You know, as you, as you move through life, you'll, you get to realize that there are connections in life. Again, watch out for attachments, but those connections are so important in your life. And, and, and so, you know, one of the, uh, the German, if you, I saw you taking notes, this, if you ever look up Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you ever heard of him? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was in Germany, and he led revival. He's a, he's a theologian. He understood the Word of God as good as anyone. He died in his early 30s. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was executed by Hitler. And when you study his life, it's amazing some of the things he said. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer once remarked that churches where all illusions are shattered he said, we see each other up close and personable, personal, so we see all there is to see. It's not always a pretty sight, but that is okay. Through our pain and tears in good times and in bad times, as we laugh and play and pray together, in our worshiping and in our serving, we discover each other, and somehow we see Jesus. I remember when I got to church my first time right off the bat, the first year, I thought, man, this is heaven. And then I started seeing people for dirt bags, <laughs> you know, and what a dirt bag I was too. But I decided, and I preached this also for, I'd rather live with the stink than perish in the storm. I'd rather stay in the house than to be outside. I enjoy what God's doing here. But these are guys that are good. Colossians 127 says, It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And sometimes Christ shines out, and you see that gift. It's also Christ in you and among you, and the whole congregation, and the whole messy, glorious gathering we call the church. You know, we have our good days, we have our bad. You know, we, we doubt, we worry, we fret, we fuss, we question. I've taught you forever. Quit saying the word safe. This is not safe. We're not in a safe environment. We don't have a safe species. There is no safety in our species. And yet I will be leaving to get on a motorcycle and somebody say, be safe, pastor. I beat my head. I bang it. And, you know, this is just one little thing. Uh, I've been busy, pastor. You know, I don't like busy. I'm effective. I ain't been busy in years. I don't want to be busy. But we, we keep falling back on our old crutches and our old way of thinking, you know, and things of that nature. And it keeps on moving. But you got to keep rejoicing with people. I just smile now and say, okay, I'll be safe. <laughs> you know, so. Oh, Christ is there in all of it. Sometimes that, that, that's where you see him best. So I say enjoy all of it. The good, the bad, the ugly, the happy and the sad, the positive, the negative. You know, for the Ecclesiastes 3 reminds us there's a time and a season for everything. What matters most? 
Well, what matters most? If we stand back and we look at this passage, it challenges us to think eternal. Someday Jesus is going to come back again. If there's one thing all Christians agree on, is that Jesus will return. They don't know the when, the how, but they know he's returning because he says that he would when he comes again. Amen. In verse 19, what we just read, Paul mentions when he comes. That leads us to a very personal question. What will you have to show for your life when you stand before Jesus? A good job, a college degree, money in the bank, lots of friends, large reputation, a successful career. The praise of others. I said in second service, I don't know if I said it in first service on Sunday, that when I, when I get to heaven, you know, I, I, I just got in my mind's eye, I see that God's got this big screen and he's going to have all these celebrations that I've done, all these great accolades and achievements and starting of churches and missions and places I've been and preaching the gospel and thousands of folk led to Jesus. And I'm going to smile and go, yeah, but there'll be another screen. And this screen's not all the things I did bad. This screen is all the stuff that I could have done. That I didn't. All the finances I could have gave and I didn't. All the time I could have prayed and I didn't. All the time I could have talked to somebody who went to hell and I didn't. All the things that I could have done and I wasted life. I wasted time. It is so precious. I was talking with a friend today and he said, uh, I told him I mowed grass. I went down and mowed the church. I just get, I just got to mow grass. I got to have some solitude. So I jumped on the mower, took off down to church, mow grass. Here's February, and I'm mowing grass. I need him mowing, and so I'm mowing the grass. And uh, he said to me, you got one of them zero turns? I said, yeah. He said, I had a ranch once, but man, he said, I couldn't afford. He said, I didn't want to spend all that money on them zero turns. I said, that's your call. It's according to how important time is to you. It's according to how important time is to you. Because time to me is very valuable. And we got 40-something, 50 acres, we mow. And if, I, if I'm on that... John Deere, push, yeah, right, like, I mean, it's going to take me days to get it done. But if I'm on that zero turn, for me, after the years I've been doing this, 17 years, I can tell you, it saved me much time, and time is money. Amen. I don't have a lot of time. Everybody running out of time. It's the one thing you run. Once you get at a certain age, you're downhill. Just saying. All right. Listen to me. If that's all we've got to show for our years on planet Earth, then you have to shift your priorities. Sooner than you think, someday we'll be lying in a box six feet underground. There will be our dirt, the grass growing over our dirt. And all the things of this life won't matter at all. Someone else will have your money. They'll have your job. Your fame will fade. Your glory will disappear. And everything we own will belong to others. We'll eventually be forgotten except by the people who stumble on our gravestone a hundred years from now and they ask themselves, I wonder who this guy was. I wonder who this guy was. There are only two things in this world that are eternal. The Word of God in you. The Word of God in you. People. The only two things that are eternal. Everything else is small stuff. Everything else is going to disappear. All that stuff you're arguing over, fighting over, and fussing about, and worrying over, it's all going to be gone. Amen. These are the only two things that last. Amen. Most of the things we worry about, they're not even going to matter in three weeks from now, let alone three months or three years. Oh, we still bothered over it. We focus on the trivial, and we forget about the pursuit of the eternal. 10,000 times, times, 10,000 times from now, you'll be glad you invested in someone else's life. And the word of God. I had a teacher, and I'll close with this. First Peter chapter one, verse four. Close it with this. And into an inheritance that can never fade, perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. You've heard me use this scripture before. I use it a lot at funerals to remind people that what we do here matters there. And that we will see an inheritance when we get to heaven. But I'm really wondering now, because I've often asked, I don't know what it is. But I'm thinking what Paul mentions here. Our inheritance may be you. It may be the people that we're around. Perhaps God has other ideas about other inheritance. But I promise you, you're one of them. Paul said, you're my reward. That pastor Paul was good at it. He reminded people, you're my reward. Amen. All the things, you're my joy, you're my reward. I had a professor in college, and he'd quote this at the end of every year. He would stand on the stage. It was the last thing he'd say as we left for 
our summer jobs or back to the states from where we were from. He said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Mm. Only one life. And it, I'm not telling you to jump off and quit your job, do something crazy. I'm just telling you, your job is your ministry. Your opportunities to eat with, uh, eat with folk that are retired at Denny's is your ministry. Amen. Your opportunity to meet with a ladies club is your ministry. Amen. That when you, you know, that four-wheel drive Jeep is your ministry. Lucinda, you know, to wherever God has you, whatever he has you doing, that's your ministry. Amen. Grandma, Grandpa, you know what your ministries are. Amen. Many times we can't wait back to get back to our ministries. To see them grandkids, to be able to pour into them. That's what life's about. Stand with me. And that faith would take courage to live for Christ. I love the words reckless abandonment. Reckless abandonment. To be reckless with your life as far as just taking a chance. I, I told some of you I'm, I'm rehabbing this body. Today I was working out. I don't work out like these dudes do that are around me. And this great big Marine was next to me. And I knew he was a Marine because he had a tattoo of a Marine. I'm observing. And I got a medicine ball, and I'm moving it from this side, Joseph, to this side, this side, to this side. And I look over at him, and he's got these 60-pound dumbbells. And he's ripping and ringing on. I got a medicine ball, and I'm moving it from this side, to this side, and this side, back to this side. Finally, I stop. And I look in the mirror, and I see him looking at me. I'm thinking, I know what he's thinking. That old sissy, you know, and he's all confident. And I looked at him, and I went, like that. And he stopped me, pulled his earplug out. And he said, yeah. And I said, thanks for your service. You're welcome, sir. And all of a sudden, all that tension in the gym just went away. I didn't care. He didn't care then if I was messing with a medicine ball or a rubber band. <laughs> Amen. But there was somebody that appreciated his service. You know, this is, I, everywhere I go, I just want to be able to make that connection and keep connecting and teach you to connect. Paul said, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors that teach us are to help teach you to do the work of the ministry. I, again, misnomers in church. Well, pastor, we pay you. I've always felt like God paid me. He pays me through you. Amen. You can choose to give me a raise or you can choose to take money away from me. That's your call. That's how I'm set up. But remember, you hurt me, you hurt him. You hurt David, you hurt the other ministries and the, minis and the missionaries that we support and the fact of taking care of this property and all the, the finances we have to use for it. But hear me, when, when, it, when it comes to, to this life, and the time we've got left here, I have to help you do the best you can to do ministry. So when I hear you've been at a hospital, when I hear you call people, when I hear you send letters, you are my reward. It ain't the fact that, because there's a lot of people back in the day that said, well, we paid a preacher to do it. He got to go do all that. You know, well, you, you can think that, but there comes a time when you got to ask yourself, I mean, you're handling three dogs and a cat and two kids and you can't even keep up with it. And I got what I got. And I took on two churches and I thank God for that. Glad to be a part of two churches. But God says something else. Paul said to the church in Philippians, Philippi, to die is gain. To any believer, to die is gain. Amen. I stand and I believe that. Father, I thank you for this house. I thank you for your people. I pray that you will give them good health, clear vision, bold words. God, you'd give everybody in this house a servant's heart. And with much joy. As we serve you in this place and outside of this place and the places that you've called us to, I pray that God grants this church unity, vision, conviction, love for one another, passionate service, hearts on fire for you, and tenacious courage to do great things together in 2020. Give us the vision to do it. For Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. God love you. Hallelujah. Keep praying for the people we've been praying for. Come on, give God a praise before we walk out of here. Do that. Amen. Love you guys.